You are listening to the Centropic Oracle, an audiobook podcast of science fiction and fantasy short stories that make you think and feel. What the Replay Shows by Phil Void. Shinny, noun. A pickup game of ice hockey played outdoors on a rink or pond. The weather was perfect for Shinny that night at Georgia Park. No, wait, I should back up a bit before I talk about what happened with number 66. First thing I should have said was that this actually happened. I know when someone says something like that, it usually means everything that follows will be a bunch of hokum. So I know you probably won't believe me when I tell you about that night, but I can prove it's all true. I wish I couldn't, but I can. Now that I'm thinking about it, I should also tell you one other thing. My body creaks more than an old wooden floor, and the kids at the outdoor rinks call me Old Man now instead of the Ice Man. Even so, I can still skate rings around most of them during a game of shinny, although I pay dearly for it the next day in twinges and whinges, as my wife Gabby calls them. I'm still average at everything else under the sun, the latest being my attempts at handymanning around the house. My buddies used to call me Johnny B in school because I got straight B's and everything, and my talent at being ordinary hasn't changed a bit over the years. Okay, back to that night at Georgia Park. Like I was saying, the weather was perfect, cold enough to make the ice hard and fast, but windless so your face doesn't freeze solid. These days, we almost never get weather like that. It's either warm enough to melt the ice or some crazy blizzard is raging across the city. The game was just starting when I arrived at the park. I didn't bother going inside the shack beside the rink. I sat on the snowbank surrounding the rink boards to put my skates on. I hopped onto the ice and dropped my Sherwood onto the pile. The sticks were divvied up, half on one side of the rink, half on the other side. A tall guy on the other team fished a puck out of their net. He carried the puck over center and the game was on. Everything else disappeared. The snow-covered field around the rink the glowing lights of the houses next to the park, the noises of the city. The teams were pretty even, a typical shinny mix. Teenagers with backwards baseball caps, frozen ears, and jerseys from NHL teams whose cities never saw a lick of snow. Guys in their 20s and 30s dressed more sensibly in wearing holy jerseys from their old teams. A girl with a long ponytail and teal tape on the blade of her stick. As I always do at the beginning of a game, I stayed back, playing defense, getting a feel for the ebb and flow before I started playing for real. When I was ready, I took the puck away from an old-timer in fogged-up glasses, slipped it through the legs of the tall guy, deked around two surprised teenagers, and then it was only me and the goalie and the pure elation of open ice. I tucked the puck into the net, making sure I didn't break two of the most important rules of shinny. No hard shots and no raising the puck. A few plays later, I remember a teenager in an Atlanta Thrasher's jersey asking me if I had ever played pro after I had scored a goal using a Savardian Spinorama. I used to get asked that a few times every winter when I was in my 20s and 30s. It felt pretty good for a moment, then it felt really bad. It made me remember that in the real world, I was mediocrity personified. I played harder after that, trying to recapture the bright kinetic forgetfulness. After an hour or so, I decided it was time to go home. My toes were so cold, they felt like they'd shatter if something hit my skates hard enough. One more goal, and then I was going to leave. I lifted the stick of a wobbly guy in brand new skates and took the puck. I rushed down the ice, not doing any moves, just going faster than everyone else. I cut towards the net, and my stick was lifted into the air and flung out of my hands. I jerked to the side in surprise, causing one of my blades to catch a gash in the ice. I fell, sliding over the ice, past the wide-eyed goalie and into the net. I had just scored myself instead of the puck, which brought laughter and cheering from both teams. The player who had taken the puck away from me was rocketing back down the ice, slaloming effortlessly through my team. His blonde hair was flying back as he flashed towards our net. He was wearing a black-and-yellow Pittsburgh Penguins jersey, Number 66. I crawled out of the net, stood up, and brushed the snow off my pants. I looked around for my Sherwood. It was stuck in the snowbank piled behind the boards, perfectly perpendicular. I skated over to get it, feeling a flush of warm blood in my cold face. I yanked it out of the snow and rejoined the game. 
number 66 was the best player I had ever seen. I should have gone home then, but I couldn't make myself stop playing. It didn't matter. I couldn't touch him. His team scored goal after goal. To top off a miserable night, it started to snow, hard, swirling crystals that stung the eyes and cheeks. Even though it felt like I was losing something more than just a game of shinny, I headed toward the gate in the boards. I would soothe my wounded pride with a mug of hot chocolate. I reached for the gate, and a black and yellow blur whooshed in front of me, knocking me off balance. I fell flat on my butt for the second time that night. I watched number 66 deke around three players, spin, and shoot while gliding backwards, a no-looker. The puck banked off a post, slid along the goal line, hit the other post, and went in. I scrambled to my feet and made a beeline for our net. I thought you were going home, said a teenager in a Florida Panthers jersey. A few more minutes can't hurt. I retrieved the puck from the net and headed up the ice. I rushed straight at number 66. He swooped forward to poke check me. I pulled my stick back, raising it high into the air. Slap shot position. He quickly veered out of the way. I lowered my stick and carried the puck by him. I deked around a couple of their players and slipped the puck between the goalie's legs, the coveted five hole. Number 66 was not pleased with my fake slap shot. He pointed the wickedly curved blade of his stick at me. You're going down, hotshot. I just smiled at him. Now I knew I could play with him. The girl with the ponytail carried the puck out of their end. He took the puck from her, even though they were on the same team. He turned on the jets, blasting by everybody, leaving a trail of powdered ice and dumbfounded players. I went after him. He was closing in on our net when I caught up to him. I knocked the puck off his blade. One of my skates grazed one of his, and he tumbled to the ice. I stopped playing. Sorry about that, I said. Are you okay? In one smooth movement, he stood up and came towards me. It was an accident, said our goalie, sounding nervous. He was wearing an orange Jack O'Day automotive jersey. He didn't mean to trip you. Come on, let's play, said a big guy in an expensive ski jacket, sliding between us. We've got a great game going here. Other players, the old-timer in the fogged-up glasses, the girl with the ponytail, echoed the skier. Number 66 stared at me for a long moment, then shrugged. He tapped my chest once with the finger of his hockey glove. That Oilers jersey doesn't mean you're actually the great one. He skated away. Boy, said our goalie, blowing out a foggy breath. For a second there, it looked like he was going to drop the gloves on you. I'm not sure why I didn't leave right then and there. Maybe if I were good at analyzing things, I could figure out why I kept playing that night. Since I had tripped number 66, we followed another one of Shinny's unwritten rules and gave possession of the puck back to the other team. Not surprisingly, number 66 scooped it up and deked around the big skier. He flew past me, blonde hair swept back, and put the puck in the back of the net. He coasted back up the ice, sneering at me the whole way. I just smiled at him again. I had this weird feeling, a feeling I had never had before and haven't had since, that not only could I play with him, I could beat him. He did the pock hog thing again and scored on us by stick handling through our whole team. I set up a breakaway goal with a long thread the needle pass. He scored again with a blazing end to end rush. I answered with three quick goals in a row, a natural hat trick. One goal was because of a lucky bounce, one was a Phil Esposito garbage goal, but the last one was a butte, the result of a neat tic-tac-toe passing play. The lights went off before number 66 could touch the puck again. It was 10 o'clock. The rink attendant, a 20-something in a hopelessly optimistic Toronto Maple Leafs shirt, stopped the game. We all grabbed shovels and started scraping the ice. Except number 66. He skated right at me. He stopped on a dime when he reached me, making a huge spray of snow flare out from his blades, coating my legs and jersey. A few flecks of ice even landed on my face. Everybody froze, watching us. But he didn't drop his gloves. He handed me his stick. I was too stunned to take it. I just stood there, 
holding the shovel, my breath clouding the air around us. Here, he said, pushing the stick at me. I asked him why. Because you won tonight. I may have mumbled a thanks or something as I reached out with one hand and took his stick. It was the lightest stick I had ever held. My Sherwood was a clunky two-by-four compared to this glossy black feather. It must have cost a fortune. You might not be so lucky next time. He pushed himself away from me and glided over to the boards. I was about to go after him to give the stick back when I noticed there was something wrong with his jersey. See you later, hotshot, he said, winking at me. It was the numbers on the back of his jersey. It looked like there was another six, identical to the other two. I squinted, trying to peer through the blowing snow as he hopped over the boards and disappeared into the night. I didn't know what else to do, so I looked down at the stick. It was so light, it felt like my hand was empty. I was still holding it, although I could barely make out the black shaft through the smoke swirling up off it. I skated as fast as I could over to the other side of the ice and threw it out into the snowy darkness. Okay, I know what you're thinking now. Smoke and sixes and a mysterious stranger. What a load of malarkey. I don't blame you. Even Gabby pshaws the whole thing every time I tell this story. So do my children. I bet even my youngest grandchild wouldn't buy a word of it if I ever told it to her. She still believes in Santa Claus. Heck, I thought the same thing myself for many a year. Like I said before, I'm not great at analyzing stuff, but even I can think of some garden-variety explanations for what happened. Did number 66 really disappear into the night after he hopped over the boards? I doubt it, unless he wanted to ruin his blades. He probably went into the shack to change like everyone else, and was already gone by the time I finally got up the nerve to leave the ice. Let me tell you, that was one well-scraped rink that night. What about the extra six on his penguin's jersey? It was dark and snow was gusting every which way. I was shaking with fear and exhausted from the game to boot. My mind was obviously playing tricks on me. I'm a little surprised I didn't see him transform into something even weirder like Dracula or the Wolfman or Don Cherry. That's not all as far as the number thing goes either. I played shinny with the fellow who was wearing the Jackaday automotive jersey many times since then. He always wore his Jackaday shirt even though it got tighter and tighter on him each season. I asked him about that night one time. It was the winter before the cancer took him. He remembered number 66, of course, but thought he had been wearing a Nashville Predators jersey and that it had been number 55 or 88. The smoke coming off number 66 stick is an easy one to explain. It was just steam caused by good old body heat and the condensation of the shaft from ice and sweat. I'm still a little embarrassed that I thought it was actually smoke. I'm usually a lot more level-headed. The Big Shot career is a little harder to explain away. I had always been, you guessed it, an average employee for Berenson Cranes Incorporated, but I got a promotion exactly one week after that night and kept getting them regular as clockwork. I was the CEO and owned a good chunk of the company by the time I retired for good. I sold my shares for a couple hundred million, if you can believe them apples. Personally, I find it passing strange for a guy who basically punched the clock every day and did his job, no more, no less, to end up owning the whole works. I'd like to think that my big win over number 66 gave me the confidence and inner strength to succeed, except that feels like the cheesiest sort of wishful thinking. So maybe I just got lucky with all those promotions, a right place, right time kind of thing. I guess it's possible. I could be one of those charmed life folks, which might hold water if it weren't for the nightmare. I've never talked about it with anybody else before, not even Gabby. I sleep like a baby, except for one night a year. That's when I have a nightmare about number 66, and yes, in case you're wondering, it happens on the anniversary of the game. In the nightmare, I've just tripped him by accident, and he's staring up at me, but his eyes are gone. There isn't any blood on his face. His eyes haven't been knocked out of his skull because of my trip. There are only absences in his face, deeper than the night sky. It's not like the extra six on his jersey or the smoking stick. I don't remember seeing something going on with his eyes that night. So maybe I've knocked out that memory because it's too terrifying to remember. 
Let me tell you, the nightmare on its own is pretty friggin' scary. How could it be so real if it didn't actually happen that way? I'm not saying the nightmare is proof of anything, but it sure has me convinced that something more happened than a game of shinny that night. But I told you I could prove it all wasn't a bunch of hokum, and I know a recurring nightmare isn't going to get the job done for you. So, here it is. I have the stick. I went back to the rink early the next morning and found it. It was easy to find because it was the only black thing in a field of newly fallen snow. I keep it locked up in a closet in the basement, but I take it out every now and again to have a look at it. I'm not exaggerating one bit when I say it's one of a kind. There isn't anything on its smooth black surface from blade to butt. It doesn't have any nicks or scratches. There's no manufacturer's name or model number on the shaft. I tried to scrape away some of the black with my belt sander to see if the maker's name had been painted over. Didn't even scratch it. I've got all these power tools for my handyman hobby, but none of them can leave a mark on the glossy blackness. I couldn't break it with a sledgehammer or burn it with a blowtorch. I went out to the rink at two in the morning one time and took a bunch of slap shots with it. I don't have a particularly hard shot, but every single one of them was a cannonading drive, as Danny Gallivan used to say when he called Hockey Night in Canada games. The last slap shot I took went right through the boards, and I did my usual mediocre job of fixing the hole. I never did find that puck. Have you ever heard of a hockey stick like that? I sure haven't. Sherwood would go out of business in a couple of months if they started making indestructible sticks. Okay, that's about it. The last thing I'll say is that if you're ever in Peterborough and get it in your head that you want to see the stick for yourself, then you should drop by my house. It's on Wistful Street. Any time except for Sunday evening. Gabby and I go out to a restaurant and then see a movie every Sunday. Just don't ask me if you can have the damn thing. I'd be too tempted to give it to you. You see, he's going to come back for it one night, and I know I'm not good enough anymore. We hope you enjoyed What the Replay Shows by Phil Void, read by Larissa Thompson. If you'd like to learn more about the author and narrator of this story, or make a donation to them, follow the story page link in the description. If you would like to submit a story for consideration or apply to be a narrator, a link to our submission guidelines is in the description. This story is copyrighted 2020 by the Centropic Oracle.